you really kind of immerse yourself in that moment. There is a very quiet, fulfilling place that you can try and dwell in for a minute or two. This sort of happiness overcomes you. I, I just start smiling, you know, like a child. It's just capturing a moment in time. Making pots is relaxing. The physical act of manipulating clay into something that is practical and functional and beautiful at the same time and can then be given life in a garden planted full of amazing flowers or tulips or whatever. Then there is a very quiet, fulfilling place that you can try and dwell in for a minute or two. My first sort of impression of the picture is, you know, the great big grounding marble plinth. And then you've got this amazing view up to the beautiful terracotta urn, the two putti, cherubic children, joyfully playing. So if you look really closely, you can see that he's just about to kiss or is looking at a tiny little bird. We've got the acanthus leaves, which is a symbol of life, really, of immortality coming up the side. And if you look up here on the right, you've got the, the glimpse of the rim, a really chunky, probably a fluted rim. The urn was probably uh, inspired by first century BC marble urns. But Louis XV took a fancy to these urns. He lined the palace at Versailles and the gardens with possibly hundreds of urns. He really instigated the trend for garden urns. So this urn is made in a very similar way to the urn in the painting. What I've done is I've filled a plaster of Paris mold with clay and hopefully I've got the bash the clay in so that when I remove this, you'll see the detail. So let's prise that off. So there we go. So you can see you've got quite a high level of detail, but um, it's going to need a fair amount of fettling um, or touching up to make it to the standard of the, the urn in the painting. Very, very little has changed since this urn would have been produced. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I love making pots is because I am directly linked to every potter that ever existed. I love this period. Every time, every time I write in this period, a script in this period, it, it, just, it, it just brings me so much joy. So it says, Jan van Heysen, Fesset, 1736, and 1737. The, the painter is, is, has really exquisitely executed this piece. So when you look at the signature, the, the painter has painted it as though it's, it's been cut into the, the stone. Because when you, when you let a cut into stone, you, you V-cut. So you cut one side and then you cut the other side. So you get this V-shape. So when the light strikes the the V, you get this shadow, so it really causes it to lift up. And you see this thin line down the middle of the V. And look, he's done it right here. So the thing about the, the signature is it is clearly Dutch. There's, 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 there's no two ways about it. This sort of almost infinity loop flourish that connects up to the H. It's very typical of this period to join uh, what I, I call crossing a gulf to join two letters together across other letters. So I used a pointed flexible metal nib for this. They would have used a small left oblique cut quill. As soon as I see something, my brain starts to fill the timeline in. I worked in a pyramid in Egypt, and so I, I use that as my, my sort of fixed point. So every time I look at text from any period, I try and put it along that timeline because it, it, it's really amazing to feel the connection to the scribes that went before me. 
I had really bad COVID in January. I was hospitalized for seven days. After about three weeks, I was in the kitchen and I, I tried to make a note and I couldn't even write with a Bible. All of that made me think, you know, calligraphy really helps us to heal ourselves. When we write rhythmically and we're breathing rhythmically, we generate a meditative field and it brings this peace, this sort of happiness. You know, as soon as I hold a pen in my hand or, or better still a quill, I, I just start smiling, you know, like a child. 10 years ago, it would have looked so dated. And now this is what all florists are trying to achieve, that mix of so many different types of flowers. I would say my style is um, sort of wild and gardeny, slightly sort of romantic and tumbling. Should say there is some design element to it. <laughs> the tulip was revered as, as in Holland, the most wondrous flower and the bulbs were sold for small fortunes. Um, and this one in particular, because it's got the stripe, it's really special. And that's why it's given that real centre stage and the beautiful long stem is going up through the arrangement. They start in such a tight bud and, and take quite a long time for them to sort of open and really unfurl. And like most flowers, they're at their absolute most beautiful just before they all fall apart. And that sort of wonderful fragility that everything has. This is obviously um, a painting that's been done over time. These flowers certainly would not be in season back then, all at the same time for them to be put together like this in a vase. The poppy at the bottom here is completely open and you know that if you just touched it, the whole thing would shatter over the floor. And it's, it's hanging down, poking in the bottom, there's a little auricula which would have a very short stem. The roses again have got that sort of real, any second now, those petals are about to fall all over the table. Forget-me-not says apple blossom. And then you've got the, the multi-headed narcissus, which smells so beautiful. The hollyhock is, is in more bud than most things in there, right at the back, which is really lovely. Flowers are transient. They last, some of them, two days, some two weeks, but they are gone, and then you're on to the next thing. So to capture it at that almost split second when things look at its most beautiful, I think it's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing, and nowadays we do it with photography. It's just capturing a moment in time. It gives that sense of hope that even in the depths of winter, you know that the green shoots are coming and there's going to be something. And I think particularly during COVID, that's been really important to have that sense of things will, will go on. When I'm out monitoring nests, I mean, a lot of the time is actually spent sitting and watching and listening. You have to understand what the bird is doing, you have to watch its behaviour, you have to listen to its calls. And you really kind of immerse yourself in that moment. My eye as a, as a bird watcher and as a nest recorder is drawn straight away to the, to the chaffinch nest at the bottom of the painting. You can immediately tell that it's a chaffinch nest. And that's because even though it's quite small and quite delicate, it's kind of got this bulbous outline. It's made of fine materials, it's made of moss, uh, the spider webs that kind of bind it together. Because they are quite small and compact, we use them as props when we're training people and they will keep between seasons. I'd say that this was certainly a prop and used from life. So within the nest, there are these five eggs and they're kind of an off-white, almost kind of pinkish hue to them with some slightly darker markings. The colours look a little bit faded. Uh, when the nest is freshly built, it's going to be very vibrant green because of the moss. The moss is fresh, it's alive, but obviously the longer the nest sits around, that tends to fade. It is amazing to think with nests that the bird has built this with its bill. I mean, particularly something like this, which is so finely woven. They're a very common bird in the UK, and there's a good chance you might have them breeding in your garden or close by, but you probably won't notice them. You know, the birds tend to be quite secretive because they don't want to draw attention to their nest. Chaffinch would have been a familiar species uh, at the time that this painting was done. You know, it is a species that was uh, well known. It occurred across Europe uh, and was probably fairly common at the time. And it's interesting, it's remained, you know, a common bird. 
One of the interesting things when we went into that first lockdown was just that surge of interest. People were taking more interest in their garden wildlife. And it is a really deeply calming experience to do, that close proximity to wildlife, that special moment. Thank you.